Yeah. Okay, members, um, thank you for coming to this uh, meeting. I know it was called at short notice, so I appreciate um, the efforts that people have made to, to make the meeting possible. If members can do the needful with their electronic devices, just keep them away from the, the microphone. Um, we've got apologies from Gemma Dolan and Emma Rogan. Patsy is joining us um, by teleconferencing. Uh, and if I could just ask the clerk if anyone has indicated uh, to her their voting intentions in their absence, understanding order 1156. Uh, for the record, Gemma Dolan and Emma Rogan have delegated their votes to the Deputy Chairperson, Linda Dillon. Okay, has members, any members got any declaration of interest just in respect to this meeting? If not, we'll move on. The draft minutes of the meeting that was held on the 2nd of April are there for members. Um, consent if you're content that they're an accurate uh, reflection. There's one amendment I just want to, to make to it, which is to indicate that Patsy was in attendance uh, at that meeting. The technology dropped out, uh, and so we'll make an amendment to record that he did attend the meeting. If members are content with that amendment, then I'll sign the minutes accordingly. Agreed? Agreed. <coughs> Okay, we're, matters are rising. As a follow-up to the oral evidence session uh, with officials on the COVID-19 response at uh, the last meeting, the Deputy Chair had indicated uh, that she would like to ask the Committee to write to the Minister for Justice, requesting uh, that she provides clear guidance around supervised access arrangements, including that where there is any concern about the safety of the child, alternative arrangements such as FaceTime, Skype, uh, etc., should be used as a temporary solution. Um, and if I want to invite Linda, if she wants to make any more comment on that, and then we can seek agreement to write to the minister. Yeah, I, I know that Rachel had actually written to the minister to ask for clarity um, around the supervision, supervised access. But see, to be honest, so what she got was not clarity. It, it was just, it was very waffly. It didn't give any real clear direction very much what the direction that's been given is around you know try to come to some accommodation the reality is if you have to go to court and if there's an issue around child safety accommodation was not able to be reached so why would accommodation now be able to be reached so i think that there and i had spoken to to women's aid and i said look give me a solution you know that we can actually put forward to the minister rather than just asking for more clarity and getting the same kind of thing back that we actually put forward some type of solution that can give clear guidance because we're not trying to stop people from getting access and, and being able to ha cont have continued access with their children but the safety of the child has to be paramount mm -hmm. so just think if we write as a committee to the minister and say can this be a proposal because even more maybe a grandparent was previously the person who would have supervised access that can be accommodated through virtual access as well you know whether it's by uh, zoom or facetime or whatever way that that can be done so that can be accommodated because obviously it's not just physical harm to a child what a parent would say to a child can also be harmful so that just because it's virtual the supervision still has to happen i understand that but it can, all of that can be accommodated in, in a virtual way okay well rachel you, you're you're content with yeah i know it, like an avid representation made to me on the similar issues about access and, and a way to try and accommodate it at the moment so i'm, I'm happy to agree to that if members are content we, we'll action that okay there's a letter from the chair of the northern Ireland policing board just um on the recent appointment uh, requesting a meeting of myself and linda to discuss the policing powers contained in the coronavirus act and to inform the board's scrutiny of the police use of these powers and also other policing issues of mutual interest so arrangements we will seek to uh, put in place to provide that meeting with uh, myself and Linda and the chair of the, the policing board. Um, I should add it really is the Department of Justice that needs to advise exactly around the Coronavirus Act as opposed to this committee, um, but nevertheless happy to have the, the conversation. Okay, the item then on the agenda um, is in relation to police trainee regulations, which is the purpose for this meeting, so we'll just allow officials to come in now to take their place. Patsy, I'll just check that are you able to pick up proceedings okay while officials are taking their seats? 
Hello. I'll take that as a yes. I can hear. I can hear you talk twice. The loop. The, he's watching the TV and. Sorry. The the uh, just one thing I say here is that the the online video is out of sync with the telephone, so it's a wee bit difficult to hear. Okay. Um, the synchronisation of the two isn't happening. A wee bit difficult to follow it, but you will want to hear. Okay. We appreciate that, Patsy. Well, then, let, let me welcome uh, to the meeting um, Moira Campbell, Deputy Director of the Policing Policy and Strategy Division within the Department of Justice, William Duglow, Head of uh, Police Powers and HR Policy Branch from the uh, Policing Policy and Strategy Division, oh. and Temporary Assistant Chief Constable Tim Mayers, who is operational support from the PSNI to the meeting. Um, you are all very welcome. Um, the session will be recorded by Hansard and then published on the committee uh, web page. So Moira and Tim are at the table to provide an overview of the proposed statutory rule and the operational implications, and then William is available to answer questions on the detail of the statutory rule uh, if that is necessary. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to yourselves at this stage to take us through the statutory rule. Okay, thank, thank you very much, much Chair. Uh, I plan to keep uh, the opening comments brief, uh, just to afford members the uh, maximum amount of time for questions. Uh, but the background to this is that the Chief Constable has asked the Department to amend the existing police trainee regulations in order to disapply on a temporary basis the current requirement for a trainee to have completed 145 days training before being attested as a constable. We've consulted with the Northern Ireland Policing Board and with the police staff associations, all of whom have been content in principle to support the Chief Constable's proposal. The Minister of Justice has therefore agreed to this request in order to maximise the PSNI's operational capacity during the exceptional circumstances in which we find ourselves as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. This change is a contingency measure and will only be used in the event that the Chief Constable considers it both necessary and proportionate to do so. Alongside this legislative change, PS and I are actively considering what the basic level requirements should be for an officer to be able to undertake their duties. This is being informed by recent College of Placing guidance on minimum standards and will also take account of requirements specific to this jurisdiction. It is the PSNI's intention that if this option were to be used, the newly attested officers would be deployed alongside experienced officers and have mentoring support. In addition, these officers would remain in development during their full probationary period of two years, during which time any remaining training requirements would be completed and they would be subject to ongoing assessment so as to ensure no diminution in standards. PSNI colleagues have undertaken to keep the Northern Ireland Policing Board fully briefed, both on how they are planning to use this flexibility and on how they do so in practice, consistent with the existing accountability arrangements. Both PSNI and the Department have also engaged with the Office of the Police Ombudsman, and PSNI have undertaken to revert to them should they decide to reduce the training time and to provide specific details of the areas of training that would be impacted. The, tar the Department will also, of course, be keeping the need for this facility under review, and we will continue to main maintain close contact with PSNI so that the Minister can make a properly informed decision on how long this should remain in place. When it's no longer required, it would be our intention to bring forward a fresh set of regulations rather than including a sunset clause in these regulations, given the uncertainty around how long the pandemic may last. I'd like to conclude by thanking the committee for arranging this session so swiftly. We've asked you to work with us on a significantly compressed timetable and we appreciate your willingness to do so. Ideally, we would like to make the change in advance of the Easter break, if that's possible, uh, and we're happy as ever to take any questions you may have. Okay. Thank you, Moira. I appreciate the little bit of feedback here, just with the, the teleconferencing system um, coming through. Uh, just a, a couple of questions for me then. Obviously, this is a, a contingency measure that's being put in place, um, and it's part of the resilience 
modelling plan that the PSNI are, are putting together in terms of uh, potential scenarios around the COVID-19 uh, response that they need to put in place. I suppose my question is, um, at what point will this be triggered, um, that if it becomes necessary for student officers to have to be involved in, in these duties, when is that likely to have to happen? Mm. And if you can elaborate a little bit on what is the overall PSNI resilience model <clears throat> um, in respect of COVID-19, that would be helpful. Yes, of course, uh, Chair. Um, firstly, just to echo thanks for, for the very short uh, notice response to this. Um, we welcome the opportunity to discuss these. Um, we've worked very hard to model against how we would retain our core services um, against a range of scenarios where we would see a reduction in staff availability through absence. Um, and that could work right up to, as you're aware, at times there were projections of up to 30% of your frontline staff being unavailable. Clearly, depending on uh, how an infection were to spread and geographical impacts, that may impact certain areas of the business more than others. So my colleagues in the service executive team and I have worked very hard to set out a comprehensive business continuity plan about how we would support specialist functions, for example, um, so what our resilience looks like for our firearms officers, but also how we would potentially start to choose to reduce um, the services that we deliver in line with threat, harm and risk to the public. And by doing both of those, trying to protect our frontline capabilities as long as possible. The assessment is that were we to get a po to a point where the police service could no longer deliver our core duties, and those would include the likes of emergency response to 999 calls and supporting agencies and other what we call Article 2 or life at risk issues, that would be the point at which the Chief Constable may consider that that is a significant enough risk to take what is a very, very dramatic step to reduce um, the training time to allow us to move, say, one of our uh, horses into an operational environment, which would give us access to potentially a, an additional 50 police officers. Um, so it is, it is part of that thought through um, model that was to, to stack up against potentially significant impact on our operational capability. I trust that it's reassuring to make a couple of points. As we stand today, the Police Service of Northern Ireland is, is we are operating with approximately about 11% um, of our staff unavailable. Um, that sits quite favourably in relation to comparative police services across the UK and Ireland. So this is not an option that we see as being required right now. Um, it is also not a desirable option for us. Um, training and police training has been a critical theme, both within the original independent review of policing and then obviously the policing board who hold us to account around police training. Um, we provided a very extensive review of our, our student officer training programme to the board a number of years ago, which had just seen significant investment in that. So we're aware that we ask our officers to do a very difficult job. Um, we value the quality of the training that we provide. So it is not uh, it is not a desirable step for us to take. It's not one that we would take lightly. But certainly in a setting where the chief constable found that it, the potential was that lives were going to be at risk because we didn't have enough police officers to deliver a service, it would be an option we felt it was prudent to create a capability within the regulations with the minister to, to be able to undertake. Okay, no, I, I appreciate that, and I think it is important that you've elaborated on, on terms of mm -hmm. your, your modelling, because this is quite a significant change in the law, yeah. um, mm -hmm. and uh, it would be a very significant departure from uh, the current procedures for, for training of your student officers to do that, and I think we do need to have that transparency as mm -hmm. to why mm -hmm. in order to give the justification for this change. So I welcome that information that you're giving to us. Um, you, you've indicated around 11% currently unavailable. So is that ballpark six to 700 officers? Uh, appro approximately, yes. Obviously, that's a change in figure as, as this unfolds, but it's, it's in that region, yes. And is that a trajectory which is increasing, or has it remained static for the past number of weeks? Um, at present, we're seeing okay. it's, it's, it's pretty consistently, certainly over the last week, been sitting around that 10 to 11% mark. Um, but clearly, as you'll be aware, um, those people who understand these things, there are a range of different modelling scenarios that are available. And I think it is, our, well, I know it is our responsibility to plan to respond effectively to all of those scenarios. Mm -hmm. so one of those scenarios would be that we would see a significant reduction, uh, in, increase in absence. We know that there are police services in England and Wales who have experienced an excess of 30% absence at times. Um, I'm, 
I'm confident we could probably still maintain our services at that stage with, with what we have, but it would certainly be getting difficult at that point. And the last thing we want to do is, is be in a position where we're not able to fulfil our responsibility to protect our communities. Okay. Because um, I understand the Minister wants to make this law change to, to take effect from Friday, from tomorrow, um, which would indicate that there would have been a concern that you know, we're going to have see an acceleration on that. It may well be that this is just more a prudent step uh, to provide for a worst case scenario and that's why I'm asking about is the trajectory all of a sudden accelerating to require the, the setting aside of the normal 21 day procedure where, whereby the Assembly would have to, to vote on this um, and, and I suppose that gives me some reassurance. Is, is the call in of the student officers to carry out those duties, is that the, the ultimate fallback or is there modelling taking place that what if things got uh, in, in a space where it deteriorated further, that you required to go beyond the use of student officers? Is there modelling being done on that basis? Um, so our, our business continuity plan allows us to um, take a range of steps to push resource to the most critical functions. So we've, we've done some of that already. So our, our local policing resources have moved on to a new shift pattern, which means that they're more resilient and there's more cover. Um, my own resources and operational support department have, have been taken off non-urgent taskings and have been put on to, to frontline work. And a number of those measures can be implemented over time as, as numbers reduce. I would suggest that at the point where we get to deploying those officers from the college early, we're, we're pretty much getting to the point where um, our, our options have narrowed considerably. Uh, and that is some way down the road. So again, to offer reassurance to the committee, this is not a decision that we would take lightly. Um, but as I say, on a daily basis, the potential of being able to release 50 additional officers at a, at a key critical moment is, is certainly a, a potentially useful option for us. Okay, thank you for, the, for those answers. Um, Linda? Did you say that, that this option would allow for 50 additional officers, Tim, is that right? Well, uh, yeah, it's the ballpark. Generally, the, the courses that come through are in the region of, of, of 50 per course. They, they vary from course to course, depending on numbers and then depending <coughs> on how many withdraw, but in general terms, it's in and around that figure, yes. Okay. To be fair, in general, and I mean, the Chair has covered much of what I would have been thinking of anyway, and you've, you've already said in terms of specialisms, so, I mean, obviously somebody would not be carrying a firearm unless they had had firearms training, um, so all of that kind of stuff is covered, and I am content that if the Policing Board has looked at this and they are content, and they will be overseeing this, obviously, in, in terms of so, for example, if, if this were to come to a point where it had to kick in, would the Chief Constable be contacting the Policing Board at that point to, to make them aware of that, so that they're aware from the initial, okay. Um, so I'm content that, I mean, the, the, the Policing Board should have oversight of this, and I think that's, that's where it lays at. And I don't have any real issues. Obviously, you, you would have concerns with anybody not being able to complete their training, but we are in very different times. I'm actually happy to hear those figures, but you're right, that can change on any given day. But the fact that you're sitting at 11 per cent when some other forces are, are, are have an absence of, of 30 per cent, I think, is, is certainly a positive thing. And I said to Alan Todd last week, I feel that the, the PSNA currently are carrying out um, their duties in terms of even the social distancing stuff in, a, in the right way. But going forward, I think it will become more difficult, yeah. and probably you will need more officers on that kind of duty because we are going to go into the good weather. We are; it is going to become more difficult to make people stay at home, and mm. you know, and that will all depend on what's happening, I suppose, and, and on the grander scheme of things. If people see the numbers of deaths going down, then they're more likely to think mm. everything's okay. Let's get out there. So that might put a bit more pressure on, on yourselves. But I think that, I mean, it's a far enough ask and I do appreciate that you have come to us at this point that it's a contingency rather than waiting to the point where it was required and then a decision having to be made very very quickly whilst this had to be called together quickly it's given us an opportunity to ask questions and even if we had to knock it back it wouldn't be my recommendation that we would um, but it, it has given us that opportunity so I appreciate that you, you did bring it to us so in such a timely manner as you possibly could. Thank you, Gordon. Thanks, Chairman. Thanks very much, everyone, for coming in and 
addressed in this meeting at such short notice. Uh, could you just clarify the full period of training that the officers should be going through? So the, the regulations require a minimum of 145 days training. Um, my mental maths isn't great, so I can't translate that into weeks just off the top of my head. But at the moment, we provide 20, it was 23 weeks. Um, we've actually reduced that in March to 21 weeks. And that was part of our social distancing measures to allow us to reduce the amount of time our, our most senior courses in and overall start to reduce the number of officers in training. Um, so at the moment, it is a 21 week course. If you compare that to Police Scotland's initial training course, which is 12 weeks, and training that is authorised by the College of Policing for England and Wales, which is 13 weeks, you do see that we provide a longer package here. And in normal time, we think that's the right thing to do. Uh, clearly, there are Northern Ireland specific training needs that have to be delivered, including firearms training. Um, but actually, on top of that, that gives us the time and space to reinforce a lot of the, the key lessons through content provided by external speakers. So, for example, we'll talk and train our officers about vulnerability, but then we have really good input from external speakers from the likes of Women's Aid and other organisations. In all truth, at the moment, because of the issues around uh, social distancing and other matters, many of those external speakers just aren't able to come right now. And those are inputs that we can provide at later stages during an officer's probationary training when they come back for further training. So by, by looking at those, we're able to, we're able to reduce some of the requirements. Um, but certainly for us, uh, on a standard day, that 21 weeks allows us to, to train people in the basics, get them through their assessments, but also then help them reinforce some of that learning in a simulated training environment, which we find is really helpful before they're um, released or sent out to, to the local station, where an awful lot of further training and learning then occurs already. And as it stands, a probationary officer will be assessed uh, for two years once they go out on the ground and they have to demonstrate operational competence on the ground. That will continue. That will still be required and that's still there for now. So hopefully there's some reassurance around that. Our objective would be that if, if we are re required to curtail the training, all the core assessments and qualifications that an officer must complete to be competent would still be completed. What we would maybe look to do is curtail some of the, those additional reinforcing measures. Some of those can be delivered remotely, um, online. Some of those can be delivered at a later stage. And some of the ones about awareness of internal police units and things like that, we can actually just provide by way of, by way of um, access to the website and, and things like that. Do you see them spread out across the province to various stations, or would the work within the Greater Belfast area or, or whatever? So in, in, in basic terms, those officers, when they join the police college, are allocated to a district at that point, and they would, they would go to those districts. So that allocation at that time is done against our HR model. Where do we require those officers? And that, that's how that would go. The fact that they would complete their training in a, in a constrained period of time wouldn't influence where they're deployed. It, if, if an officer is attested as a constable in the police service of Northern Ireland, we are saying they are competent to perform that role, and we'll, we'll send them to the district to which they've been allocated. Okay, Chairman, just the other issue that's been already touched on, I think the big issue for all of us as elected representatives, police on the ground trying to tell people to, to go home mm. and disperse crowds. And I know in the North Down area we're getting a lot of that. A lot of concern has been raised about this weekend. Mm -hmm. Along the coastal path, right from from Sea Park, I suppose, mm -hmm. right to Port of Ferry, with such a coastal area, mm -hmm. and how I've been I've been already in touch with the police in, today about the very issue, and I know they're telling me they're, they're they will do their best and they're mm -hmm. monitoring the situation, but I suppose it comes back to resources. So if this goes some way to you know to addressing that or may go towards, it, let's be fair, I think it's a positive thing, but uh, I think again. All of us should stress the need for people not to congregate in large groups in open spaces and public areas. It, it really is a very negative thing to do. And people see the positivity of being out and about in the good, in mm. the fresh air. Mm. But the negativity of it is, is this social distancing. And people are blatantly uh, not observing the rules. And I think we would fully support the police and whatever measures they can to reinforce it this weekend. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Gordon, Patsy, you, you've indicated you want to come in, so uh, I'm ha happy for you to, to ask your questions now. 
Yeah, Chair, um, sorry if people in advance if people can't hear me properly. I'm having a lot of difficulty here hearing the um, the discourse that's going on there, but if people can bear with me, uh, we are in the country here, so um, I'll just ask uh, two or three questions for the PSNI there in terms of the attestation of police trainees. Um, I'm trying to establish just that everybody in principle supports what's happening and the difficult times that we're going through. But um, what, what I'm trying to establish is there's mention in the documentation about practical scenario training that um, they may not be doing. It would be interesting to get an insight into that. But uh, probably as important, if not more important for them, would be that they have adequate amounts of PPE for those circumstances that they're in and also training in the use of PPE as well. So those, those are my questions. Thanks very much, Chair, if they came across clear enough there. Mm-hmm. Yep, they have. No, we, we can hear you very clearly, Patsy. Sorry, you can't hear us just as clear, but I'll, okay. I'll, I'll hand that Thank over. You. Yes, um, so I think to, uh, to address the first issue, as I mentioned, we do put a lot of um, emphasis on exercising the learning that the officers have achieved in practical scenarios within within the college, and that allows us to reinforce that in a safe learning environment. Um, we're keen to maintain and continue that, but uh, we're also aware that actually it's not a it's not a core element of the course. Uh, once an officer has passed, for example, their assessment on how to deliver first aid uh, or how to um, c- protect themselves and others safely, um, or in their knowledge of the law, they are they are competent to to deploy. Uh, to a local station. We are also aware that no matter how many simulated experiences you have of arresting an individual, the first time you, you arrest someone in real life, and I can still remember the first time I had to do it, it is a daunting experience and you need an awful lot of support to go through that. That experience will remain. Um, our view is that if the Chief Constable was in a position where they had to decide between having sufficient officers to attend emergency calls and protect life and uh, having to curtail some of that experiential learning for an officer, that, that, that it is right and proper that the Chief Constable is able to make that decision um, and therefore, thankfully to the Department, they have considered that amendment. In respect of personal protective equipment, my colleague Alan Todd, who is the goal commander for, for our response to COVID-19, has been working exceptionally hard um, both within the organisation and with our colleagues in health to ensure that uh, we have sufficient public uh, protective equipment for our frontline officers and staff, and uh, we are certainly seeing more of that available. The specific training around PPE um, is being delivered at the moment through um, online learning, through videos and um, other content such as that. Um, again, we are very grateful to colleagues in health and others who have been able to educate us in, in how you doff and don a lot of this stuff. It is not something that we naturally would be aware of. It is not part of our initial uh, curriculum as a police service for our student officers, and it would remain something that we would provide training in in the district setting. Um, that seems to work very well for us, and I think we would continue to provide that once an officer is in the district and, and against need. So it's not a skill set that you require all the time, but when you do require it, you need to know what you're doing. And at the moment, we're, we're working very hard to ensure our officers are both equipped and knowledgeable in how to use that equipment. Good to see you. Very much for that response. And uh, I listened very carefully to what Mr. Mears was saying there about um, uh, Mr. Todd uh, in trying to work to ensure the sufficient PPE equipment. Do, do you, in fact, you have sufficient P- PPE equipment? Um, I, so, I, 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 from my perspective, we are working very hard to maintain the supply. I was with one of our um, teams who are dedicated to a specialist response to COVID-19 last night, and um, they were able to show me that the, the equipment that they have. But the reality is that, that the rate of usage at the moment, and I know this is the same in health, is significant. So it's important that at all stages that we collectively um, have access to supply chains that are reliable and that can continue to supply that material. And I think it's also really important to be clear that NI as a total has a requirement for PPE. And it's important that this doesn't become a competition between departments to, to, to try and access materials. So the Civil Contingencies Group, chaired by the Head of the Civil Service, is working very hard. And we know that, along with the UK government and others, we're working hard to have access to that. And at this stage, um, we are able to provide that equipment to our folks. But 
you will all be aware of the pressures on that market and on supply chains globally. And it is certainly the colleagues of mine who are working on that are working exceptionally hard to maintain that supply. Okay, thank you, Patsy. Um, Rachel? Thank you, Chair, and thank you for coming to the committee um, at such short notice today. I have a couple of questions. Just in terms of the shorter period of service, it's down from 140 de- 45 days. What's the lowest limit of days that you would be considering? Um, <clears throat> so, from our perspective, uh, any decision to, to reduce will be at a moment in time, so it will depend on the number of officers that we require and the stages at which courses are at. Um, I think certainly when you look at the Scottish and police, uh, College of Policing courses at 12 or 13 weeks, I would be keen not to go that far. Um, and I think we would be looking at, at curtailment in the region of weeks rather than months to allow us to be able to, to accelerate people out. So um, I'm very hesitant to give a specific date because clearly we, we, we didn't stipulate a new figure. And I think that's really important that, that we're able to make that judgment call. Um, when we get to that, but as I've said, we feel that we can truncate the course and still get a lot of the qualifications completed. Um, it would still take longer than 13 weeks because clearly there are additional functions, but um, somewhere in the region of sort of 16 to 19 weeks feels like something that could be done. But again, a lot of that will be down to the conditions at the time, the pressures on the chief constable, and uh, the priorities that we have. It's somewhat of a moving picture of, um, as of when what you need. Um, the second point is, the, has there been any conversations with officers that this might apply to as in the student officers, and are they comfortable being deployed? Um, so we're, obviously the, the, the student officers who currently are in Garnival have been through significant change in the last couple of weeks from the conditions that um, they, they joined in. Um, I write to you with the specific communications we've given them. I don't, I don't have that to hand right now. And a lot of this is obviously preparatory work. So what we're trying to balance is there's an awful lot of information flowing to our officers, particularly our student officers. And we're trying to ensure they know what they need to know and when they need to know it. A lot of this preparatory work doesn't directly influence them right now. But clearly, if we were getting into a position where we felt that we would have to, to reduce that, we'd be communicating fully with them so that their understanding of the support that they'll have um, is made really clear to them. Finally, just in the Minister's letter to the pack that we got, it had stated about new constables um, being in certain circumstances supporting senior officers from a range of duties, including monitoring and enforcing social distancing and the closure of certain businesses. Mm-hmm. Now, last week I raised this with ACC Todd, who told the committee that as he saw it, the PSNI involvement had been conversational and in this the role should be done in a partnership with the police at the back end. Is that still the case? And will these officers get training on how to enforce social distancing before being deployed? So um, I think the, the case is, and, and, and I pick up on, on the comments from Mr Don as well around this, uh, undoubtedly the most successful route to, um, to seeing ourselves through this pandemic is that we all commit to do what we can to protect the NHS and to minimise the spread of this. Um, I think if this becomes exclusively a policing matter, then I don't think we're going to succeed. So um, we have been given powers under uh, the coronavirus legislation. Um, Alan has talked far better than I can around how we will take a graduated response to that. Um, We still believe that the most important way to do that is to educate people and to encourage them to stay at home. But the enforcement powers are there, and and if it's required, and if it's in the public interest, um, we will use those. But I do reflect on what was said. this is a societal commitment. This is something we need to do to protect the most vulnerable in our society and to protect the NHS. And I think it's a really encouraging sign that when a lot of us are out, we are seeing the majority of people complying with that. And I would be keen that we continue as, as leaders in this community to encourage people to do that. Sadly, where people choose not to do that, then we do have the enforcement powers. But I, I don't believe that the enforcement powers are going to get us out of this issue. I think that societal commitment that we're seeing is what will get us through. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Um, Paul? Yeah, if I could take a lot thorny issue first, Chair, uh, because it is a massive issue. So, over the last number of weeks, the, my mailbag content of that has all been about economics, about employees, employers, furlough systems, mm-hmm. job retention scheme, uh, 10K and 25K mm-hmm. grants. Mm-hmm. But there are, are these wee spikes whereby, when, when the population are seen to be 
behaving inappropriately, mm. congregating in one area mm. or mm. You know, beauty spots, then there is a, a, a small spike in, in calls. Mm -hmm. That changed today dramatically. Okay. Uh, and it was because of the very sensitive issue of the Francis McAnally funeral, mm -hmm. uh, paramilitary style funeral. Mm -hmm. That in itself is bad enough. Mm -hmm. but then when you have 200 people gathering, roads closed, mm -hmm and no police about whatsoever. Mm -hmm. My mailbag went through the roof today on that one issue. Mm -hmm. now, on a number of issues, people are angry about the paramilitary guard side, mm -hmm. but more so because there's so many people at the minute dying mm -hmm. alone mm -hmm. and then being buried alone. Mm -hmm. uh, so I suppose with your operational sense at the minute, mm. how can something like this, a gathering like this take place? Hearing everything you say about conditioning people and trying yeah. to persuade people as opposed to enforce and I get that and I'm 100% mm -hmm. behind you mm -hmm. but when people act inappropriately like this mm. it really gets the population angry mm -hmm. and that then could have a massive effect and impact on how other people behave yeah how do you counter this so I I'll, I'll apologise in advance that I'm not across the detail of that incident. And um, I, I, I apologise for blindsiding you. No, no, that's quite what I'm here for. Yeah. Um, so um, I can certainly I can certainly look into that. I mean, I think I go, I go back to my previous answer, which is um, as much as at times as a as a part of the world we can be a divided community. I think we're very very clear and we're united around the fact that um, there's a job of work to be done to to protect our most vulnerable and to protect the NHS. Um, and I think people need to bear that in mind. Uh, where incidents occur, the police will engage. We will take a, we will take an encouraging and engaging approach at the outset, and we will consider enforcement as part of that. Um, and um, I can't comment on the specifics of that incident, but clearly I appreciate that at the heart of all this, there are massive, massive cultural and personal sensitivities about um, about how. The regulations set out restrictions around probably one of the most sacred kind of acts and sacraments that we have, which is the burial of a loved one. And uh, it's something, as a human being, I've had to reflect on. Um, it's something that we all do, and I think it's it's going to be the most challenging area ar around how that's managed. And that's where we welcome the support of church leaders, and that's where we welcome the support of other community leaders in having that dialogue with people. Um, about how we do what's right for society and what's right for, for the most vulnerable and balance that with, with very, very sacred and very precious um, opportunities that we have to say goodbye to our loved ones. And I think those apply to, to all people, regardless of whether the cause of death has been COVID-19 or some other cause of death. Um, so I, I think that's, that is going to be the challenge and will remain so. And of course, these are hard. These incidents are hard to police at mm. the best of times. Mm -hmm. You imagine some of these individuals that we're talking about here being, being in among that. Now they'll mm. not be the most experienced officers dealing with it. They won't be, of course, but they could well still be in the periphery, mm. and, and that could be exploited by some people, especially in criminal gangs or paramilitary gangs. Is there is there been a risk management of that taking place? So we've worked very hard as part of our operation to start to ask the question what types of crime will be impacted by um, by this and um, you know you will be aware that that we've worked very very hard to work with women's aid and others around um, making awareness of the services available to those experiencing domestic abuse because there is a concern that people who are uh, remaining at home that, that that will increase and we're working very hard to support around that but to, to give you reassurance we are working hard to understand um, what are the changes in society as a result of these unprecedented times, and how will people who are of a criminal mindset seek to exploit those, and then reposition our resources in a way to effectively protect the community during that? Um, and we continue to do that and work very, very hard uh, to deploy our resources to that, whilst also working hard to support uh, the NHS and, and the executive around the social distancing and, and all the other public health advice. With regards to the actual uh, uh Regulations. I, I see, I, I see risks in this which can be managed, mm. but I also see positives, mm. um, and I see positives with regards to people. And I was going to say young people. It's not necessarily young people now applying to join the police, but people who are joining the police will get hands-on, experienced training mm. with experienced personnel beside them, mm. and, and that that's that can be very valuable. Mm -hmm. uh, so, can I ask? 
police have to do a two-year probationary period. That's right. Yes. So, so how does this, if, if they were now, if they're now removed from their training setting mm. or their cadre and put into an operational sense, will they then have to leave that operational environment again to go back into a training cadre? And, and <coughs> the dynamics of that, uh, you're nearly going backwards as opposed to going yeah. forwards. And, and, and the psychological effect that might have on yeah. recruits or officers, uh, so, constables. Yeah. And, and then, uh, no, well, I'll let you answer that. Oh, no, well, so, so, I mean, this is exactly why it's not an attractive option to us, because actually, whilst we have them as a captive of it, audience in the college, we really want to give them all the support and training in one go. Um, there, are, there are two additional phases of training that occur during that probationary period in, in which they come back with their original course and we do some reinforcement training and we do some additional training and a lot of that is just to check in on people and make sure that they're 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 developing the way they should those so to give some assurances from our perspective we are very keen that the constables that we attest at the point when they're sent to the college are fully attested and have all the skills that they require and all the qualifications so there's no difference with that and their probationary period will remain at two years and will, will be broadly the same, um, but they will have that dedicated kind of senior constable support throughout that. So in that sense, there is no, no change at the surface. What it means is there are some, some, there may be some content that we have to find an alternative way to deliver. So, so if, you're, if you're removing a, a recruit from a training cadre a month early, yeah. uh, will that month, will that calendar month have to be accounted for at some point or does the does the two year probation start from whenever they leave Garnival and go straight into operational sense? So I mean what we would look at is to take the contents of those uh, four weeks and in simple um, the people in the college are better at this than me yep. so I'll, I'll give you the Tim version which is a bit simpler. Um, stuff that we have to do um, but we can do it another way, we'll do it. So online content, for example. So we train our officers in a lot of police computer systems, some of which are very straightforward, but can take two to three days. There's no reason why that can't be completed remotely over a period of time in a station, or actually could be completed prior to entering the college. Um, we've talked about some of the other kind of reinforcing content, or some of the other content, which I guess uh, private companies would call onboarding. So. Here's what the organisation is. Here's some of the cultural things you want to know, some of the leadership skills, things that we think are really, really important for development, but actually in a point where we just don't have enough police officers to go to 999 calls, we can deliver that at those two checkpoints later on and build it into that content there and deliver it then. So um, it's not a case that we'll be sending somebody out and then having to bring them back for that full four weeks. We're thinking very creatively about how we can deliver the training in different ways. Okay. And bear in mind that all of this is building up to the introduction of a, of a university qualification with the University of Ulster next year. So we're working very hard to continue to professionalise all of that training. And on the final point then, uh, I suspect that your programmes have been, as you've already said, has been, not depleted, it's probably the wrong word, but has changed. Mm. Uh, and, and I'm sure people are still trying to go as furious speed to try and see exactly what they can do and when they can't do mm. it. So, so what would have changed remarkably, how many cadres are going at the, how many recruits courses are going at the one time? So um, you'll recall if we think back to um, what, what, what I struggled to remember, which was a world before all of this, um, the police service was working very hard to increase our numbers. Um, and we were actually re recruiting at a rate that was in excess of the peak of the pattern yes. uh, period. So um, we were building up to, to training, uh, I think it was around 600 officers this year. Um, that would have seen uh, five to six courses operating in and around Garnerville at any one time, which, which could be around 250 people. When social distancing was introduced, we were aware that that's too many. So we've taken steps to um, pause the entry of the next two courses that were to join. Um, we've reduced the senior courses tenure from 23 weeks to 21 weeks, and we're looking at using all of our training sites more in a more agile way. By doing that, we can reduce the number of student officers and staff significantly in the college, and that allows us to have better spacing in the classrooms, better spacing in the canteens, and then the various other training facilities. We're able to observe the social distancing advice as provided by public health. Um, so that 
in broad terms means we're, we've reduced it down to right here now about three courses. There must be, and I, again, I don't know, I've never been through it, uh, and I respect everyone who has, uh, there's bound to be physical manifestations of training that may not be able to be conducted because of social distancing. Mm. Are there any concerns even at the, the primitive stage of training and the people starting their courses now or, or have just started that their training could, could really be impaired because of this? Um, so, so, I mean, I think undoubtedly there are elements of operational training that are very difficult to deliver in a social distancing space. I would commend the work that's going on in the college because what I suppose is really important to point out, the police service about sees about 350 retirements a year. So even just for us to stand still with our numbers, we need to get 350 people through. So the training that goes on in the police college is, is vocational training, and it's to prepare uh, young men and women who've asked to serve our community so that they can go and do that. And it's really important that we keep that moving as best that we can. We've had to reduce that. Um, and in doing so, it means that in some of those environments, we can continue doing some of that training. But the commitment is that nobody will leave the college without having demonstrated the full range of skill that's required. Some of that just requires a different approach. And almost on a daily basis, we're having to reassess the training that we deliver and trying to look at new ways to deliver that. So it's, it is a very dynamic space. It is challenging, but we're not dropping our standards. The standards remain, but we are having to reduce the numbers. So when you've less people, um, you're able to do more dedicated work and you're, ab you're able to space out more. Okay, I wish you all the best in the coming weeks. Once. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Paul. Doug? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, could, could I just ask, uh, Mayor, please? Um, I mean, this is a fast moving situation. We all get that. And, and just last week, I spoke to ACC Todd, uh, and he said that these officers who finish training early would not be um, public facing, but they clearly are going to be public facing. That's a change. We all know that's changed. That's, that's a change in a, in a week. Can I just ask? to get a sense of what the consultation has been with the policing board uh, and the police federation in regards to this? Yes, we um, first of all, when we um, first started having a conversation with the um, police college, they gave us a heads up that a request was on its way. Uh, I made initial contact with uh, the chief executive of the policing board and with the staff association, so the police federation, uh, the superintendent's association and the chief police officers uh, association just to get a view from them quickly in principle about whether they thought this was a sensible idea, um, pending further detail on it. So we had that sort of initial um, touching base with them. And at that point, we also made contact with the Office of the, the Police Ombudsman, again, to give people the opportunity to indicate if there were any significant concerns with going down that route. Um, we then um, got a more formal request from the police. So we undertook um, a, more, a slightly more detailed consultation um, setting out what it was we were proposing to do and what the, the change was we were, we were planning to make, similar to the, the information that we've uh, provided to, now to the committee, though perhaps not as much detail around how this would work in practice as, as we have now, because that has been developing and that's something that we've been um, discussing as we go. Um, the policing board have come back to give their um, support in principle. They have asked some points of clarification and we're working with them on those, but I have been talking as recently as yesterday with the, the chief executive and none of those points are anything that they would see as an impediment to us moving ahead with this. Um, I have to say the staff associations have been very supportive of this because they understand the rationale for doing this and you know, back to the chair's point about is this because we have an immediate concern? No it's not because um, I think uh, we're, a pattern we're seeing across justice at the moment is levels of self-isolation frontline staff have actually dipped slightly in the last week because some people are now coming back off self-isolation. So it's not that there's an immediate crisis here, it's more just the general uncertainty as you referred to, plus the fact that um, we're advised that between now and 20th of April there could be an increase in, in cases, there could be a, an impact on capacity. So um, although normally we would like to take a lot more time over something like this, um, we felt that it was prudent just to take the steps now to have the facility in place, but with the undertaking to um, policing board, police ombudsman and others, that we would keep them very closely apprised of, of how this is intended to work and how we intend to do it. And as I said at the outset, the usual accountability arrangements and the arrangements for oversight will still apply. And, and that was put to the full policing board or to the 
previous chair of the policing board or the new chair of the policing board? I mean, uh, the a... letter we've, re we've received is from the current chair of the policing board. Um, I'm not cited on precisely what consultation took place within the board. We, our contact was through the chief executive of the board. Uh, okay, so just at this moment in time, we don't know if this is if the full board has, has actually sort of scrutinised this in any way, do we? Uh, I, mean, we have, I couldn't say for certain if that's, if that's okay. happened. Because I think I agree with, with Linda in this. I mean, the policing board are the ones who really should be scrutinising this. Uh, and, and I would just have that, I would have that concern that if this has just gone to the, the new chair of the policing board and other members aren't fully read into it, I, I would just have a, a slight concern about that. You know, but but I, I leave that um, uh, to see how that works out in the next couple of days. I guess the problem is, of course, is we're being asked to agree something here as a justice committee, which will come into being in a day tomorrow. Uh, and with it being in tomorrow, th th that one day, and us signing off on this in many respects, um, I've got to say and be honest, and this is my failing probably, I didn't know we'd reduced from 23 weeks to 21 weeks mm. in March. Mm. I, I didn't know that. I mean, I'm not saying I should know it, but I'm saying I didn't know it, and that's a fact, because uh, before I came here, I, I checked on the police website to see what their training program mm. was. Mm -hmm. So they've reduced from 20, down from 23 weeks to 21 weeks now already. But we don't have a sense of what that could reduce down to. So we're actually going to sign off on something here. Mm -hmm. And I get it, the reason mm -hmm. why, and I'm not saying I'm not going to, but, mm -hmm. but, but without having a full understanding of what you will, could reduce down to. Yeah. I mean, you could, in effect, reduce down to 16 weeks as of tomorrow, you know, which is, which is a, a seven-week reduction. And bearing in mind, and I know there's, there's huge changes taking place, but they do their firearms training in week 18. Mm. Um, uh, will they still do their judgmental training in regards to firearms? Um, uh, and, and, and if they do, who holds the risk when they go on the streets with a firearm if there is an accident? Mm. So um, to, to cover those elements off, I, I think th this is why we were keen to have this discussion, to bring this transparency to the debate. Within the regulations, it is within the remit of the Chief Constable to reduce from that 23 to 21. That decision was felt necessary to create a safe environment for our trainers and for our staff and officers in the college. And obviously, we have obligations to do that under health and safety legislation. So we did not take that decision lightly, um, but we felt that we were able to, to do that. Um, the move to, if, if we were to talk in general, to, to curtail by somewhere in the region of a month, would still allow for the full firearms training and all of those elements to be provided and for officers to be accredited as they currently are to carry a firearm. Um, and they would still be required to then undergo their operational refresher training um, in line with, with everybody else. So, uh, and we have engaged with the police ombudsman's office as well around this to make it absolutely clear that what we would not be putting out is, if you will, yellow pack police officers. I mean, these will still be attested, qualified and trained officers. Um, and, and therefore, the clarity will be for them that they will still be expected to act in line with the Code of Ethics, and the expectations of them will be the same as their peers who, who went before them. We're providing them that dedicated support from a senior constable to help and assist them in what, what is a very difficult environment for all new officers anyway when they move into that operational arena, but our standards haven't been reduced and the expectations haven't been reduced. Um, I think to, um, to reflect on the point around the policing board, we still will report to the board overall on our training, and this will be obviously where this decision to be made, I imagine, would be a, 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 a source of significant interest to the board. Um, we report already daily on our rates of absence um, to the department and the others, and clearly there would have to be evidence that, that that rate of absence had reached a significant point to justify a decision by a chief constable such as that, and I would imagine that there would be commitments to the board that, that would be for as short a time as possible. Um, because, as we've said, whilst we believe we can still accredit our officers to the professional level of competence to allow them to deploy to stations, it is not a desirable position. Because if it was, our course would be 17 weeks now, and we would have been here years ago saying we want to do shorter. So we accept that this comes with 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 some loss of the value added piece. But from my perspective, um, I'm confident that the college will still be able to produce well trained professionally qualified officers who understand the responsibility and the technical skills necessary to carry out their job.
and I'm in no doubt of that, Tim. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, I, I think you're doing a fantastic job. Could I just ask this question? Because there is one course which is going on at the minute, which is doing an awful lot of its work online. Mm -hmm. It won't be residential in any way, mm. uh, as it stands now. Mm -hmm. Surely they would not be considered for this end of course early if, if most of what they're doing is, is an online sort of based yeah. so, police training? Yeah, so they, they, the, the course that, that we refer to, um, the decision made around that was a social distancing issue. So, so those those people clearly were individuals who had applied to join the police, have been successful, and would have handed in their notice. So they've become employees of the police service. We have provided them with material that they can study at home, but their course duration will commence when they come and join in Garnerville. So they will, they'll have maybe some more pre-training done, but we're not curtailing the, the period of their. So if they do, if they're at home for an additional five weeks, we're not taking that five weeks off the other end. They'll still do either the 21 or whatever the new figure is. Once they're in, they'll just maybe have read a little bit more online. And got, got you now. Yeah. Uh, got you now. And, and, and it's my understanding, if I can, quick Tim, with, with two courses in at the minute, yeah. each of 50. Yeah. When, what stage are they at? What, do we know what week training they are in at the minute? Um, so I'd, I'd need to just go and confirm the exact figures. Um, but we, we did have a new course about to commence, and they're one of the ones that have been delayed. I think there is a third course that we've now reduced their time. So they're probably into their last week now, and that we've moved them to another facility. And then there's two courses in, which means that probably the senior one out of those has another five or six weeks to do, I think, probably. And then the, the one before that is another four or five under that. So they're they're midway through their course. And frankly, the priority for us is to support them, to get them through and get them uh, deployed. The, the, you know, when we think through some of the alternatives, uh, we don't want to get in the position where we're having to furlough courses and send uh, student officers halfway through home uh, to, you know, stay at home for four or five weeks when potentially we can get them through and get them deployed. So this gives us that flexibility to, to try and keep the pipeline going without dropping standards. Yeah, and, and, and Alan did say, and I fully, fully understand that. I guess, I guess my whole issue, um, uh, Tim, is, is about who owns the risk. Sure. Because you know, a 16-week officer who goes out uh, is involved in a car accident, yeah. who has a negligent discharge with his weapon, yeah. or something like that. Who holds that risk? Uh, and, yeah. and, and, and is that risk as high as the chief constable? Yeah. Or where does that risk sit? So I, I don't have specific legal advice on exactly where the risk sits, but the, the decision to reduce the duration of the course would be a decision made by the chief constable under the regulations. Um, and obviously the Chief Constable is also responsible under health and safety, so I imagine would want to satisfy himself that, that, that he can balance those two obligations. Um, as I've said, we believe that we can accredit and fulfil all those accreditations within a curtailed period, and therefore we wouldn't be shortcutting any of those critical skills around firearms um, or driving. Th those would still be provided. Um, what we would be doing is looking to curtail or off-site some of the stuff that can be done by other means. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Doug. Linda, you just wanted to come in there for a point. Yeah, just on a, a, a very small point, just Doug had raised had that come before the, the Fall Policing Board. It, it did. It, it, I, it wasn't just the Chair, it was actually the, the Fall Policing Board because I contacted our members just to see what the discussion had been around it. Um, so, so it was the Fall Policing Board who, who were involved in that conversation. I think it might have been done by. Zoom or you know something like a conference call or something, but the, the, there certainly was involvement of the of the board members, in, in their entirety. Just a quick thing in relation to the social distancing um, issues. I think there is. You're right, Tim. This it's a societal thing, and I actually think the greatest impact. I know that I, I can speak for my my own area was the community, the bars, and, and I'm delighted to be able to say this. But I'm not going to lie, I was surprised. But the bars in the town where I live closed before they were told to. They were closed a week before any direction was given, bar maybe one. So there was an, an instant thing within those businesses to say, we have to protect ourselves, our families, we have to protect the community. This is the right thing to do. We will be remembered, and they will be remembered for doing it. They'll be remembered for doing the right thing. And I think anybody in terms of whether it's business, whether it's people out and about, they know they will be remembered for doing the right thing. The people who do not do the right thing will also be remembered. It will not be forgotten. And when people in those areas die, it will not be forgotten that some people did not do the right thing. So I think there is a societal thing. And if there are occasions where maybe there is, is something going on that there's some concern about, 
I think it's the right thing for the PSNI to reach out to me as an elected rep, to reach out to local community leaders. There's, there's massive work going on within communities. Communities are doing absolutely brilliant work in terms of trying to look after people in their own community. And they would see this as part of their role. If you even look at, I mean, the, all of the sporting people that came out from, whether it's from boxing, soccer clubs, rugby, GAA, right across the board, doing videos asking people to stay at home and social distance, that had a massive impact. You know, those people coming out. So I think that we do need, you're 100% you're right, and we need to get the balance right in this. And community should be taking the lead. And then PSNA have it enforced where everything else has been has been tried. But we shouldn't be asking the PSNA to go in and enforce. That's the first, you know, that's your first port of call. It doesn't make sense because in a lot of cases you're probably talking about those most vulnerable and on the very edge of our society who are the most likely in some cases to to not comply here. So they need looked after in a lot of cases. Don't get me wrong, there will be those who just aren't going to comply and there'll have to be enforcement. But we need to make sure that we get the balance right. You know, that, that, we, that we are trying first and foremost to look after people, to, to encourage them to do the right thing. And we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility as elected representatives. Communities have responsibility. Everybody within our community, in terms of leadership, whether it is sporting organisations or whatever else, have a responsibility. And then at the point which all of that has been done and tried, PSNA enforcement. But it's a two-way street. If there's something that we should be doing or could be doing, the PSNA need us to do, then ask us, tell us, speak to us, and we will do the same in terms of where everything else has been tried and enforcement then has to become an option. But as communities, we have a massive responsibility in this, and there's no point in doing every other element of it and not doing this bit. Because um, the Assembly Chamber is sitting at half two, and, and we need to to allow the technical people to, to get ready for that. So, uh, are members content in terms of the information that we've got, the engagement um, that we've had? The, the stat rule is going to be laid tomorrow. Um, uh, it is a negative resolution procedure, so we would need to be putting down a prayer of annulment if we weren't supportive of it and then voting on that. Um, it is going to be outside the normal 21 days um, because of the circumstances that have been outlined. But I would like as a committee to be able to convey to the department the position that the committee is going to take. I'm content uh, to proceed given the justification and the circumstances that we're in. Um, but I would just like to hear from members if that's the position. So that, that's certainly my position as a party. Um, and if I could hear from Linda, Doug and Rachel. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and Doug and Rachel and, and Patsy, you're content as well. Okay, well then on that basis the committee is unanimously content to support the urgent statutory rule that's going to be laid tomorrow. And can I thank um, officials um, for coming and, and giving us a very open and transparent account of, of why this is necessary. And we appreciate the engagement at uh, such short notice, so thank you. Is there any other business members? If not, um, we'll adjourn the meeting and I'll advise of when the next one is accordingly. Thank you. Assembly, Senate Chamber, Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, Programme Sound.